Good evening, welcome. I want to take this moment and go ahead and welcome everyone to our services this evening and go through a couple of things just to make sure we're all reminded of a few things. Hope you got a bulletin. Uh, if not, there's still a few back there that you'll want to get. Read through the article and take a look at the announcements and things and those on the, those on the prayer list. Uh, I am going to take a moment and just kind of go through the announcements here. Um, as you'll know, we're transitioning out of summer series and into back into Wednesday night, uh, just normal Wednesday night class. Um, I will be teaching that class, Lord willing, and uh, I'm going to be teaching from the book, The Spirit of Liberalism. If you need a copy of that, let me know. We've been saying this a couple of times, and I think I've had one person tell me they needed a, co a book. But uh, if you need one, let me know. We're, we're getting a few of those, and we will be sure that you get a copy. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can see me. A um, couple other things here. I uh, want to remember those in prayer. Of course, Mr. Bill, uh, Sam Orr. Um, and want to be, th we're thankful for Ronnie Pierce being found as, you know, uh, Miss Nelda's cousin that was found uh, as he had gone missing and caused a bit of a stir, I guess you could say. Um, and I would say the next biggest note we have there as far as that all of us are looking at is the gospel meeting starts this coming Sunday. So a week from today, it's already here, which is kind of hard to believe, uh, 11th through the 15th with Tony Smith. And so there's flyers out there for that as well. So you want to grab one of those and be inviting folks to it. And we will be having the fellowship meal Sunday after services, after morning services, the lunch. So be sure to come ready to eat there. And of course, looking forward to the meeting itself and the preaching of the gospel. As was mentioned this morning, that's why we do this. Is so the gospel can be preached and individuals have more opportunities to hear the gospel. So we wanna take advantage of that ourselves, our families and invite as many people to it that we can. If you'll take a songbook and go ahead and mark number 497, that'll be the first song this evening with which uh, Doyle will lead, number 497, which, what song is that, Doyle? What song is 497? It's uh, Sunlight, Sunlight. Sunlight, Sunlight, okay. All right, so Sunlight, Sunlight. So if you'll take your songbooks, turn there, and we will begin there. I wandered in the shades of light till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I am at the sunlight of his love within. No oh, clouds may gather in the sky, pillows round me roll. However dark the world may be, I sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I am at the sunlight of his love within. Soon I will be a man here, like that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, 
I am at the sun, my God is love within. Turn your books to 545. 545. The name of this song is Watch and Pray. Watch and pray for the Lord is coming, coming in the clouds someday. Wash your robe in the cleansing fountain. Watch your watch and pray. Watch and pray. Oh, watch and pray. For we know not the hour when the Lord shall come. Watch and pray. Oh, watch and pray. And be ready to enter the soul's right home. He may come in the early morning. He may come at close of day. Watch and pray in his premise, proceed. Watch, oh, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Oh, watch and pray. For we know not the hour when the Lord will come. Watch and pray. The soul's right home. So give heed to the Savior's warning and his blessed word obey. He prepared when he comes to me. Watch, oh, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Oh, watch. And pray, for we know not the hour when the Lord shall come. Watch and pray, oh, watch and pray, and be ready to enter the soul's bright home. When he comes, he'll reward the faithful. What a glorious day will be. Joy awake, be ready. Watch, oh, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Oh, watch and pray. For we know not the hour when the Lord shall come. Watch and pray. Oh, watch and pray. And be ready to enter the soul's bright home. Now turn your books back to 542. Worthy art thou. 542. And after this, Russell leads us in a prayer. <clears throat> Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer. Worthy of glory, honor, and power. Worthy of all our soul deliberation. Worthy of power. Worthy of power. Worthy of riches, blessings, and honor. Worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Worthy of birth and heaven's thanksgiving. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Lift up the voice in praise and devotion. Thank the Lord be for him to bow. Angels in heaven worship him, saying, Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. 
worthy of riches, blessings, and honor, worthy of wisdom, glory, and power, worthy of earth and every thanksgiving, worthy our cow, worthy our cow, Lord, when we come before thee with singing, fill with our spirit, wisdom and power, may we outside thee, Worthy art thou, worthy art thou, worthy of riches, blessings, and honor, worthy of wisdom, glory, and power, worthy of earth and heaven, thank you, worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this day you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the worship you've been able to take part in this, this day. We pray, Father, that uh, this worship this evening will also be done in a way that's pleasing in your sight, that brings honor and glory to you. We're mindful, Father, of those who are not here. We pray, Father, that if it's because of health, that they can be restored to a good portion of health. If it's for other reasons, we pray, Father, they can be encouraged to come back and join us and to overcome those things, and to be with us again. We thank you, Father, for this time we have to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Father, for each one that's here. We're grateful, Father, for all those things you have done for us, and those things which you continue to do for us on a daily basis. We pray, Father, that you be with us this evening as we worship you, that our minds and hearts will be in the right place, and we can learn and grow closer to you. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, Chris is going to bring our lesson this evening. We're going to sing number 11 before we do that. Number 11. The name of this song is Angry Words. And uh, before we do that, go ahead and mark your books to 313. 313 at the end of our lesson, we'll, we'll sing that. 313. The name of that song is um, Bring Christ to Your Broken Life. But right now, number 11. Angry words, oh, let them down. <laughs> and bride, oh, slip. May the heart <laughs> check them ere they saw the lid. But one another, they said the Savior. Children obey the Father, bless the man. Love one another, bless the Savior. Children obey the bless the man. Love is much too pure and holy. Friendship is too sacred far. For a moment's reckless folly, the two dead awake and fall. Love one another, blessed the Savior. Children obey the Father's will, command. Love one another, blessed the Savior. Children obey the bless of man. Angry words are like we spoke of. Bitterest thoughts are rashly stirred. Righteously of life are broken by a single angry word. Love one another. Blessed the Savior, children obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, blessed the Savior, 
children obey the blessed command. Thank you, Brother Dole. I am going to take this technology tonight. So if Russ can do it, I can do it. I like tools. If I had an endless budget, I would buy a lot of tools all the time. So this kind of sermon, this sermon kind of came out of that thought of you know, toolboxes and what do you keep in toolboxes? So what's Satan keeping his toolbox? I think of toolboxes, you think of mechanics, plumbers, you know, Paul's a scheduler. He's got tools he uses. Um, you know, preacher, you go in any preacher's office, there are books upon books upon books that they use as resources and tools. Teachers, counselors, accountants, and you can just go on and on and on about any profession anybody has. They have tools, and they use those tools. And so, you know, and that's what a toolbox is. It's something that holds tools. Tools can make jobs easier. The right tool can change the outcome of projects. Um, especially you know, at some point, everyone gets excited about getting a new tool and a new usage for something that they have. And I'm not always specifically thinking about a physical tool like a saw or a hammer, but you know, software, um, printer, program. You know, sometimes we can learn a new skill. And that's a tool that we have that we can use to better ourselves. Um, a new thought or a new en enlightenment that helps us make our job easier. And I believe every person in their life, whether home, work, on the road, we all have some type of toolbox or maybe just a tool to get through a task to make us easy. You know, I think about counselors. You go to the counselor and well, they just talk to you. Right, but they're teaching you tools that they need, that you need to help you get through things. Recently, I was able to obtain what I call a new bandsaw. Uh, it's probably 40 years old. But I found it for sale and I was excited. I called the guy, asked if it was available. He said, yeah. I said, can I pick it up tonight? He's like, well, yeah, sure. Called Chuck, said, hey, can, can we go pick up a tool? He was excited as I was. He's got the exact same tool, probably the exact same age, but still, he was still excited. To the point we're driving along, he's like, oh, I'm speeding. It's like he was excited to go see this new tool. Um, and we went and got it, and I've used it a lot. I asked Brinson what his favorite tool was. He said, a hammer. I said, why? He said, you can bust, break, and build things with it. I thought that was pretty good. Multi-purpose tool. So what is Satan's toolbox? What are tools that he uses against us? He's always looking for a new tool to use on us. Now I think about a toolbox. My dad's a mechanic. I spent a lot of I spent a lot of time in a shop. I spent a lot of time with tools. You know, big toolbox. They got little drawers, medium sized drawers, long drawers. And you get down at the bottom where you get the really heavy stuff where you can't really get it out very easily, and you don't use it very often. That's the big tools. And I think that Satan's you know got those tools. That he's for each occasion he's going to come out and bring it bring on bring out and use on us, and it's all to make his existence easier to make our spiritual lack of spirituality easier and to ensure our eternity is spent in hell and not in heaven. I think about first Peter five, eight, when Paul says, or Peter says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's coming after us. He doesn't want us to go to heaven. So Satan's got all the types of tools to use for us. And again, sometimes it's not an old tool. Or a new tool. Sometimes it's something old that he's used on you before, but you're weak and he's going to bring it out again. Um, anything he can use to keep us away from Christ in the church. So what are some of Satan's tools? Now, this is an exhaustive list. This is just some I put together and I've even um, scrubbed some of them off. I warned some of you in Bible class this morning. If, if Paul can preach for three hours, you just be careful. If this is a long lesson because I don't time my lessons very well. But what's the first one? What are some of Satan's tools? Comfort. Comfort is an easy tool. Oh, I think of some of the ideas of maybe think that, well, I don't have to act right. Grace will cover me. God isn't going to send anyone to hell because he's a loving God. I can do exactly what I'm doing. God's a loving God. Or how about God understands that he understands our needs. We don't have to do all God commands. He understands my needs. He understands I need to stay home because I'm tired. It's too late. You know, the pews are uncomfortable there. I don't want to go sit in those pews for two hours. Um, or I don't like how that person sings. You know, people gripe about the way other people sings. Sing. Or they wear too much perfume. Or they wear too much cologne. 
uh, I, you could go on and on and on, and I'm not going to, but this is some examples. Or the idea of, you know, we don't have to go to all the services. We don't have to go and help and serve and prepare for vacation Bible school, do door knocking, you know, teach classes, attend all the gospel meeting lessons. You know, God understands, so I don't have to obey him. And this is one that I think Satan is just loving today. I can just watch services online. I can just sit at home. I can roll out of bed, five minutes of services, turn on the TV, you know, turn on my computer, not even get out of bed sometimes. People roll over, they grab their phone, and they click on the lesson, and they sit and watch it. Oh, it's technology is wonderful. I, I, I am able to put my points up here so you guys can look at them. Yet it can cause so many to live in sin. You know, how many souls do we just know in this congregation alone who since the pandemic have not returned for the convenience of watching it at home? Where in the world do we find in the scriptures the apostles and the church staying at home while the church is gathered together? Now, I can think of seven to ten people alone in the, our congregation that we have lost. And we are one of many congregations that have lost people who just decided that it's more convenient to stay home. And Satan's just loving that because they're missing out on the encouragement, the exhortation, the singing, all the acts of worship. They're just missing out on it. And just it's sad how much people are missing by being with the brethren every time the doors are open. You know, doors are open and we're here. You know, this whole congregation, see everybody, they stand around, they visit, they talk. They laugh, they encourage one another. And then after services, sometimes, you know, it's 30 minutes after people are still here. You can't get that sitting at home. You can't get that encouragement. You can't get that exhortation. Comfort is not in the scriptures. I want you to think about Paul. Was Paul comfortable serving Christ? I got to get used to this. Paul wasn't comfortable. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 28. I'm going to start about halfway through verse 23, 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 28. Halfway through 23, he says, In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Where does it ever say that Paul was comfortable serving God? Comfort. Is nice. I like a big comfy chair. I like our pews. They are pretty comfortable. But comfort is not an excuse not to serve God. And then again in Acts 20, verses 19, Paul again says, Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, he continued to serve God through all the uncomfort un uncomfortableness and trials he had to go through. I think about Elijah too. Uh, we think about Elijah and Jezebel. Jezebel said to him in 1 Kings 9, 2, So let the gods do to me, and more also, more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Elijah ran for his life. He was scared. Why was he scared? Because he was obeying God. And he was scared for his life. He wasn't comfortable living in a cave and having to be fed by ravens. And then when you, when you get there to the end of that passage, he tells God, when God asks him what he's doing there in verse 10, he says, they seek to take my life. There wasn't comfort there. And we think about Jeremiah as well. Jeremiah, in a part of Russ's favorite verse, Jeremiah 20, verse 8 through 10, you know, that last part, he says, perhaps... They are seeking after him. He says, perhaps he can be induced, and then we will prevail against him. We can take our revenge on him. He was out teaching the truth, and they want to take revenge on him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to keep him from teaching and preaching the word. Now, that wasn't comfort. I also think about Moses. 
40 years in the wilderness with an ungrateful group of people. They moaned and complained constantly. They fit pretty well in the church today with some people in the religious world, griping, complaining. But he served, and serving God wasn't comfortable for him. And life isn't always comfortable. You know, serving God isn't comfortable. For the first time in 22 years of being a Christian, I'm teaching a Bible class. And you guarantee those first few Sundays, I was not comfortable. I'm still not comfortable, don't get me wrong, but I'm more comfortable than I was five lessons ago. Well, I could, first day, I stand up there and sweat's running all over my body because I'm nervous and I'm just not used to it. But I decided, you know what, it's time to step out of my comfort zone. I need to do this. And you, I've loved every minute of it up there teaching. At home, opening the scriptures, reading the scriptures, reading commentaries, reading interpretations of it to get a better understanding of it. It has been some of the best studies I have always had. But you know what? For 22 years, I sat in that pew and just listened. Those in Acts chapter 2, um, they were cut to the heart when Peter spoke to them. When you're cut to the heart, you're pricked in the heart, you're feeling guilt for what has been going on. That's not comfortable. So we can't, cannot let comfort be a tool of Satan on us. A lot of people love to use the verse, take up your cross and follow me. Um, there's two different verse, sections of that. One's I think in Matthew, but I really love one in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, because he says, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Not just on Sundays, not just when we feel like it, but daily we are to serve God. And sometimes that's not always comfortable. What's another tool? Discouragement. Isn't it amazing how quickly we can become discouraged? Uh, and we can just as quickly be encouraged by people, but Satan's not going to work to encourage us. Satan's going to work to discourage us from serving God. And that's big things, small things that discourage us. Um, you know, lack of work in the church, lack of effort on people, lack of care, poor attitudes, poor attendance. We talk to our children about it all the time. Yeah, you can do it, and you can do it with a good attitude, or you can ruin everything about it and do it with a bad attitude. You know, we need to have a good attitude when it comes to serving. Uh, we are instructed not to lose heart. Galatians 6, verses 6 through 10 um, And there he says, let us not grow weary while doing good. We have to be doing good and not be weary from it. From due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We're going to reap what we sow. When we come here, come to church building, when we work for the Lord, we reap what we sow. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And then he continues there, to not grow weary. 2 Thessalonians 3.13, do not grow weary in doing good. Sometimes we might feel like we're the only ones doing anything, and we're frustrated, and we're discouraged. But we don't grow weary in doing good. If we're doing God's will, if we're doing what the Bible tells us we need to be doing, let's not be weary from it. Now, Mary and Martha, this Jesus dealt with that. Mary and Martha were there in... Um, Okay, I always get them backwards, so I'll just read it. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now Martha was discouraged about how much little work Mary was doing. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him in her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen a good part, which is which will not be taken away from her. Martha was discouraged because Mary wasn't doing her part. Sometimes we can lose focus on that. It's like, what's more important? Is it serving God or is it the color of the carpet if we were going to change it? You know, the color of our paint or what needs to be done. Another tool, a big, big tool that Satan uses today. Distractions. Life is full of distractions. I've, I've missed, listed a few up there of the hundreds of distractions we could probably just talk about. Sports, TV, fishing, hunting, crafting, concerts, movies, books, games, cell phones. Um, 
computers, cars, camping, hiking, woodworking, golf, work, family, and on and on and on. Like I said, there are so many things we can list up there for distractions that Satan can use on us to distract us from following him. And he finds more and more to give to us every day. Um, you know, entertainment of all forms and at all times. We are a nation and a people of being entertained. Want to be entertained. Entertainment in worship. So let's let's bring out the rock band. We're not in, we're not here for entertainment. We're here to worship God. We feel like we must have something going all the time. Music in the car, music when we walk, we have activities going on, music playing to be further entertained and our mind to be further inundated with things of the world. Our neighbors have a pool and it's like they're swimming, they're drinking, they got music playing, they're doing all these things. It's like there's 15 things going on at once and they're just being entertained. And maybe it isn't music, maybe it's books, different things. I constantly have something going in, all, going in my ears. I, I like to listen to even if it's just soft music while I work. Part of that's because I have tinnitus. I have ringing in my ears, so the music helps with that. But sometimes I'm constantly listening to a book. I like to listen to music. I'm being entertained. Are all of these and things inherently wrong? No, they're not wrong. But when they are used incorrectly and they are allowing us to be distracted from God, they are sinful. And there's nothing wrong with helping us unwind, you know, educate us a little bit, refreshment. But we cannot do them at the expense of God. Before I became a member of the church, I was younger. I heard someone say, God understands that I need a break, so it's okay if I go golfing on Sunday. I'd like to ask, where do you find that in the Word of God? Where do you find that it's okay and God understands that I need a break? I ask you, did Jesus receive a break? Several of us have had office jobs. You, know, you have your email, you put your out of office on, right? Put your out of office. I'm going on vacation. Please contact so and so if you need anything. Where do we where do you find in scripture where Jesus said, sorry, I'm going on a break. Please contact my apostles in my absence. It's not there, is it? Jesus for three years served God, followed God. He preached and he taught, and everywhere he went. He was surrounded by people trying to be healed, wanting to hear him teach and preach. Even when he tried to get away so he could pray and have some solitude, they followed him. So, and what did Jesus say about that in John 9, 4? I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. The night when, it's something, when no one can work is when he's no longer here, when he's dead and gone. He, we, he worked for those three years. Paul says that we need to redeem the time, you know, not waste our time doing what we want to do. Um, but what is good at edifying for our family in the church in Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. See then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We have to redeem the time. You know, it took me until 41, I'll be 42 this fall, to realize that the best way for me to grow in the scriptures and the word of God is to get out of my comfort zone, study the word and stand up and teach it. Because the last thing I want to do is teach you guys false doctrine. So I have to study and do it. I spent 41 years of my life doing things that were most of the time pleasing in myself on my free time. You know, I had a job, but you know, when I had free time, I was playing games, I was doing uh, building stuff, doing all the things that I wanted to do instead of taking the time to study the Word of God. Now, I spend most of my time studying because I, that's what is taking up my time and that's what is important. And I'm not saying that to brag on myself, I'm saying the fact that I spent many years being distracted. And this has been one of the best times of my life as far as spiritual growth because I'm not distracted by worldly things. I'm focusing on godly things. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. We need to work while we have the time. We need to serve God while we have the time and stay away from distractions. 
Greed. So these are numbers that I grabbed off of the internet for the idea of greed. The lottery, the Mega Millions is currently $1.34 billion. Do you know where that $1.34 billion comes from? That comes from people's own pockets that they have gone to the store to buy a ticket to try to win that money. There's been $1.34 billion spent since the last time somebody won it. Like this goes on every few years, it gets huge because people just spend more money and more money and more money because they're greedy. The Powerball is 148 million. Lotto America, I don't even, I didn't even know if some of these existed, is 20.9. Casinos grossed $53.03 billion in 2021. Greed. We are flaunted with people talking about money. If you watch any TV, it's all about having the newest and the greatest thing. If you watch anything, it's about having the newest and greatest thing. Everything has a commercial anymore. You know, you need to buy the newest iPhone. You need to buy the newest car. You need to have the greatest car. Um, all of it has it. And we're fla it's flaunted in our faces so that we can be distracted by it and lose out on our one true purpose. We all know this verse, 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. When we love money to so much that we don't serve God, then we have lost our way and Satan has won. Paul said it this morning, the Lord's table, for we've been crucified with Christ. Everything that we have, everything that we are is his. We shouldn't be seeking after those things. We need to set our hearts not upon riches. Thank you for this verse, Russ, from last week's sermon, Psalm 62.10. David says, trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. We can get stuck in that. As your career goes on and you make more money and you make more money and you, you get comfortable in that. Well, thinking you have that all the time when we should be using that to bless our God. Job has an interesting perspective in Job 31, 24 through 28. And he says that if you trust in riches, it's a denial of God. He says that if I have made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much. If I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment for I have denied God who is above. When we are focused on riches and money, we deny God who is above and how much Satan uses that on people today. And then we have to be aware of covetousness. Luke 12, 13 through 15, these are the words of Jesus. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. It doesn't mean you have to live in a shack. I'm not saying that. But when our love and our focus is on the riches of the world, we are not following God, and we are allowing Satan's tools to be effective on us. And all, and all of those things we just read— are all contradictory to what the world teaches, aren't they? Now, deceit. Deceit is an act or practice intended to deceive. So I'll use deceit and deceive kind of together. And deceive is a trick to mislead. One's a noun and one's a verb. Deceit is a noun. Deceive is a verb. Okay? Deceit has been around since the beginning of time. Probably the oldest tool, lying and deceit. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. From the very beginning of time, we have had deceit and Satan's been using that. There's a lot of different ways we can use that Satan uses deceit. Deceive ourselves. 1 John 8, 1 John 1, there's not a 1 John 8. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. He says that we, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves. How many people in this world think that they don't need God? I don't sin. I don't need him. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Uh, we also deceive ourselves and we do not need God. Psalm is great for bringing that out. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There, he's deceiving himself if he says there is no God. 
He says it again in Psalm 53, 1. The fool has sent his heart. There is no God. One thing that's not on there, I don't think I put it on there, was, uh, you know, here, yeah. Sorry, getting out of order. See, this is why I don't do technology. You know, being deceiving of others or deceived by others. We can deceive others or we can be deceived by others. One of the things I think about is don't encourage me. I don't need encouragement. We had a, a brother who is no longer with us, serving with us. We tried to reach out and encourage him, and he wrote us a letter and said, I don't need your encouragement. You're wasting your time. He's deceiving himself. He is deceiving himself and robbing us of a chance to do our biblical duty to encourage and exhort one another. In Luke 21, verses 8, Jesus said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The time is drawn near, therefore do not go after them. Anyway, more ideas about their deceit. You know, we don't have to serve. We don't have to attend every service. We don't have to dot, dot, dot. Fill it in there. We can deceive ourselves in how we don't obey God. I won't get into the world of religion now. How about the seat in the world of Christendom today? We're going to start out with the Pope. According to Britannica.com, the Pope, as a bishop of Rome, is thus seen to have full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church in matters of faith and morals, as well as in church discipline and government. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Is the Pope Jesus Christ? No. Who has all authority? Jesus Christ. Pope doesn't have all authority. That, that is a great deception by Satan. To put Pope up there and all people believe that, oh, he, God speaks to him and he gives these new laws. I mean, years ago, I, one of the popes said that recite, or, uh, littering and pollution is a sin. You know, the way we say in the church... Book, chapter, and verse, please? <laughs> I don't see that. I don't read it. How about Calvinism? I've been blessed enough lately to study a state class in OABS. Um, apparently, I'm plugging a lot of OABS because I mentioned it every time I've spoken lately. But on the denominational doctrines and what they teach. And one of the ones we learned last week was, uh, I guess the week before last was Calvinism. And I'm just going to touch on the first one of Calvinism, not all four, five points, but that's total depravity. The fact that we are supposed to believe that due to sin, all of mankind is completely sinful or depraved. Every part of fallen man is corrupted by sin. He's a creature that, that he is a creature that's incapable of obeying the law of God. And this is from Reasonable Theology, five points of Calvinism. Essentially, everybody has sin and you are born in sin. You are born in sin. And you don't have any other choice. You inherit the sins of your father. Well, that completely contradicts the scripture. And I, uh, you know, the scriptures that we used in class were all good. But one made me think about when Jesus brought the little child to him in Matthew chapter 18, verses one through four. He says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the grace in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children. Wait a minute. Children are sinful. Jesus telling us we have to become a sinner to inherit the kingdom of God? No, he's not, because children are innocent. You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's the first point of Calvinism, that we can prove wrong with Scripture right off the bat. But Satan has used that tool in John Calvin and his teaching for hundreds of years to lead people to hell. And it's sad. How about premillennialism? We talked about this a little bit this morning in class. Jesus failed. I want to ask you, why do you worship a God that failed if Jesus failed? How can you worship a God that's a failure? Brother Paul Coleman from Kansas City and OABS asked, how do we know God isn't going to fail again? Oh, well, he's going to come back and set up his kingdom a second time. Well, how do we know he's not going to fail again? We're going to reject him and send him back. The fact is, God didn't fail. 
John 18, 35 through 38, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered to you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom. His kingdom existed. He was the king. Is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. There is no worldly kingdom. There's a spiritual kingdom. That's the church. And I believe one of the greatest deceits of Satan has been the introduction by Satan can be found in the sinner's prayer. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, an article from faithsaves.net. It is a historical and theological analysis of the sinner's prayer by Paul Harrison Chitwood. And he did this for his uh, doctorate theology doctrine or his doctorate of theology or something. So Dr. Paul Chitwood, and I'm going to be reading this, so bear with me. So it's Dr. Paul Chitwood's 2001 Ph.D. dissertation, The Sinner's Prayer. Historical and Theological Analysis, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminar 2001, is a valuable historical analysis of the development of the evangelistic methodology dominant in the evangelical and fundamentalist world today, namely the practice of having the lost repeat a sinner's prayer in order to become a Christian. Chilwood effectively demonstrates that the sinner's prayer is a new and very recent evangelistic methodology in church history. The following extended quotation summarizes much of the valuable material in his dissertation. Chitwood notes, the sinner's prayer did not appear until well into the 20th century. Just think about that one for a minute. The sinner's prayer, what so many people believe is gives you salvation, did not appear to the 20th century. Moreover, the concept of bringing or inviting Jesus into your heart is one that does not occur readily before the turn of the 20th century. The most popular tracts containing the sinner's prayer are Billy Graham's Steps to Peace with God, and Bill Bright's The Four Spiritual Laws. Graham and Bright deserve much of the credit for the popularity of the sinner's prayer. Both of these men for years have made regular use of the sinner's prayer in their writing and speaking. Graham's enormous popular tract, Steps to Peace with God, was first published in the early 1950s. That tract closes with directions on how to receive Christ and then instructions on what to pray. People emulate Billy Graham. His use of the sinner's prayer naturally has come to be a part of the example others follow. Graham used the sinner's prayer in the 1940s. Graham would always lead respondents in the sinner's prayer, and he always quoted Romans 10, 13 before leading the lost in the prayer. A member of Graham's evangelistic team suggested possibly that the prayer may may have come from Graham's own heart. Last I checked, where's the authority come from? It comes from the word of God, doesn't it? Coupled with results of research that indicates that the sinner's prayer cannot be found in regular use before the 1940s, this evidence points strongly to Billy Graham as a possible originator of the prayer, but it is not conclusive. When asked in 1998 whether he was responsible for creating the prayer, Graham responded that he has been using it as long as he can remember. He could not recall if the prayer came from someone else or not. What is certain, however, is that Graham has had a major role in popularizing the sinner's prayer. There's a lot more to the dissertation as well. But I want to go back to that first part. So the sinner's prayer did not appear until well until the 20th century. So what about everybody who was saved according to scriptures before the sinner's prayer? Are you going to tell me that everyone in Acts 2.38 is in hell because they didn't say the sinner's prayer? Are you going to tell me everybody in Acts chapter 3 in the temple who believed that day and obeyed is in hell? Peter and Paul and the apostles, I never read of them saying the sinner's prayer. Are they in hell? How can we believe something that did not start until the 50th or the 20th century, the 1950s, 40s, and believe that is the way to heaven? How can we do it? That, that is deceit at its finest. Satan has fooled so many people. But what can we read in the scriptures? What does the Bible say about salvation? It tells us how we can become a Christian, doesn't it? We have to hear the word of God, Romans 10. 
How shall they, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, who bring glad tidings of the good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have to hear it. We have to believe, Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. John 13, 15 through 8. John 3, 15 through 8. That whoever believes in him should not have per- should not have per- should not perish, but have eternal life. Then we have to repent. Acts 2 38. Peter said to him, Repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins. Matthew 10, 32 to 33, we have to confess. Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father in heaven. We go back to Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized. It's not maybe be baptized. It's not because of be baptized. It is repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we have to live faithfully. This is another one that just blows Calvinism and their beliefs out of the water. We have to live faithfully. We can't, it's not that we just get to do whatever we want to do and God's going to have grace over us. He says here in Revelation 2.10, Do not fear any of those things which are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you do be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. We have to be faithful till the end, and you'll get the crown of life. Colossians, Brother Paul continually speaks of the faithful brethren, the faithful minister, the faithful brother, if they're not faithful, you don't go to heaven. Paul gives us a, roaming in, a, a warning in Romans 16, 17 through 18. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you heard, which you learned, sorry, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. I can get up here and preach, but you guarantee I don't have smooth words and flattering speech, and I'm not eloquent um, of speech. But I guarantee you, I will do everything I can to speak the truth. And I hope that's what everybody who fills this pulpit does. And if you don't do it when you fill this pulpit, I would hope everybody. Every man in this congregation will get up and pull you down from this pulpit because we don't speak false doctrine. So what is next? One more. Again, this isn't a complete list. Family. Oh, family. Family can be so amazing. They can support us so much in times of our need, comfort us, encourage us, teach us, nurture us, rebuke us, you know, provide us. And more and more. And family and teaching just doesn't end when you turn 18. Parents should still be teaching their children and looking for opportunities to teach and help their children live their lives even after they're out of the house. But family can be de- just as detrimental to us. They can keep us from doing our best. They can hold you down, slander us, mock us, and many, of, and many other things. When we think about the Bible... God says, or Jesus has, the Bible has a couple different things to say about family. One, it's important. You have to be a good father. You have to be a good mother. You have to be good parents. You have to be good children. Acts 6, 1 through 4, children obey your parents. And he talks about family. It's important. Honor your father and mother. And then he goes on to say, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. We have to bring them up in the Lord, train them in the Lord. And then we also have those who can be so close to the truth but aren't willing to leave the family behind. Well, what about grandma? What about mom and dad? I can't imagine that they're in hell. So I I just can't I can't admit that what you're teaching me is the truth because I don't I don't want to believe that. What did the rich man say when he was talking to Abraham? Go and tell my brothers. He didn't want to be in hell. If your family who's in hell knows that, they don't want you there. Jesus told uh, those in Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19, 
Do not think that I came, came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. In Matthew 19, 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for not my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Family should not be a hindrance to the obedience to the gospel. And if they are, sadly, we have to set boundaries and obey the gospel. And we have to encourage people to do the same. So tonight we have some of the tools that Satan can use for us, against us. And he, he's got a whole lot more. And Satan can throw those tools at us all he wants. And it's up to us whether or not we're going to let those tools work. He can try. He'll try a different tool. He'll try a different time. He'll try a different way. But it's up to us to make sure that those do not work. We have to make a decision whether or not we're going to pick up that tool. There's a movie called Dodgeball. And there's a scene in it where the guy's teaching him to play dodgeball. And he says, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a dodgeball. And he throws the wrench, hits the guy in the face. Russ is laughing. And here's the thing. We can learn to dodge and avoid those tools that Satan is firing at us. Or we can just stand there and let it happen. It's our choice. And he'll never stop. The first scripture I used this evening was that Satan is a roaring lion going about seeking who he wants to devour He's coming for us all the time. Every opportunity, he's going to come at us. And he will never stop. Ephesians 6, 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He's throwing them at us. We have to fight them. So what about us? We have a faithful savior, savior that can help us fight off those fiery darts help us fight off Satan, to avoid those evil tools that he wants to use against us. Sometimes they don't even seem evil. We talked about, about distractions. Distractions, you know, I like to fish, I like to hunt, I like to play sports, I like to watch sports. None of those are evil. But when I let them interfere, they do become a sin. And we have amazing tools to use against Satan. I quoted there from Ephesians 6, 16. All of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, the armor of God. Those are great tools to use to fight against Satan. We have a way of escape. First call, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but is faithful. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the question is, is, Will you use the way of escape when it's time? Do you need to use the way of escape at this time to get away from the snares and the deceit and the lies of the devil and turn yourselves to God? I went through the steps of salvation so those should be fully understood. And if you need any prayers of the church or need to come forward at this time, we're going to stand and sing a song and you can come forward. Bring Christ your broken life, so marred by sin, He will create a new, make whole again. Your empty, wasted years, He will restore, and your iniquity, remember no more. Bring Him your every care. If great or small, whatever troubles you, oh, bring it all. Bring it up, not be fear, a nameless dread. Thy heart he will relieve and lift up my head. Bring him your weariness. Receive 
receive it, friends. We bow your briny tears upon it, friends. His love is wonderful, His power is great, and none that trust in Him will be dead so When Savior, all at all, Almighty friend, His presence shall be ours unto the end. Without him, what would be our dark, our dream? But with him, morning breaks, and heaven is near. Turn over to number nine, and we'll sing, uh, Are You Sowing the Seed? before we're dismissed. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the new day square? For the harvest time is coming on, coming on, and the reaper work will soon be done. Will you cheat me, many? Will you not hurt any for the gathering at the harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the still and solemn night? Are you sowing the seed to the kingdom, brother, for a heart pure and white? For the harvest time is coming on, coming on, and the reaper work will soon be done, to be done. Will your seed be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, all of us? the fertile way. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? Brother, you must weep at the last great day. For the harvest time is coming on, coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Please bow with me in prayer. O oh Lord our God, we're humbled by thy greatness and by thy power. We realize that you spoke the world into existence. We realize that you love us and care for us and has provided a plan for us that we might be uh, able to be with you one day in heavenly reward. We thank you, Father, for the preaching of the word. We thank you, Father, for uh, using us in your service. And we ask that thou will be with us as we travel home at this time. In Jesus' name, amen.